Hello, I'm Sketchy Sounds from Aspertania. And I'm Hazel Hoos from the same. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to the NBS Show. Hello and welcome to the NBS Show, episode number 104. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Sketchy Sounds. Hello, everybody. My name's Sketchy Sounds. I'm sure you've gotten used to the sound of my voice by now. This is not my first time appearing here on the MBS show, after all. However, today I do have a couple more people with me from the Aspertania Tumblr team. With us here today are Hazel Hoos and Beth. Say hello, guys. Hello, guys. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well-ish, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired myself. I've been tidying my room all day. I'm guessing everyone's um, all well now, right? No no sick beds or anything? Mm-mm. Well, I feel like I'm on the edge of one of those, but I'm uh, never too sure if what it is is a hangover or just feeling ill. So there you go. <laughs> Let's just hope it's a hangover, because I'm just recovering from a really bad one. Not a hangover, mm-hmm. but a cold. But anyway, before we start the show, we need to ask you the four important questions. And um, I'll ask returning champion Sketchy first. Um, Sketchy, favourite character? Uh, it's, it's always a tie, um, because it, it depends on whether you're asking, like, princesses or main six or background characters. But, I mean, out of the princesses, I would have to say it's, it's basically a tie between Celestia and Luna. Uh, out of the main six, it's a tie between Fluttershy and Pinkie Pie, and, but, thankfully, as far as background characters go, there's only one that's my favourite, and that's Octavia. Ah, alrighty then. And episode... Um, that's, that may well have changed. I mean, it used to be party of one, but, uh, there have been some really stellar episodes since then. Uh, for example, I really loved, um, <coughs> what was it? The, the episode with Weird Al in it. Oh, um, Pink- Pinky Pride. Pinky Pride. I really loved that. And I also really loved Pinky Apple Pie. So it's a difficult one to call. And there's, you know, there's still a whole, well, there's still half a season left of new episodes to watch. So difficult to say um but those those would definitely be you know up at the top there those three mm, that is true that is true there's what from this recording onwards it's like um 10 10 episodes left i think it might be more than that because uh, it's 26 episodes a season so uh what was today's episode number 16 16 okay you're right then yeah it's 10 left hey well, i hope it's going to be a good run and edit more favorite episodes and thank you, Sketchy, for answering. Oh, moving on to Hazel. So, Hazel, favorite character? Pretty much like Sketchy, I I don't really like to... Each of them brings something new to the cast. I think the one overall, though, will always, to me, be Rarity, because she's one of the more complex characters, especially when she's well-written, and Tabitha St. Germain is such an expressive and lively voice actress. I mean, she lends her voice to so many other characters on the show, but Rarity... She makes she makes the character come alive and become a three dimensional character rather than the uh, the snooty fashionista, you know, stereotype that she essentially plays to. If James was, he would be so happy with you. What for <laughs> saying rarity is best poem? Yes. Nah. <laughs> um, I'd also say uh, the one the one episode which has always been my favourite because it was the one that essentially converted me to MLP as you know, becoming a full-flung fan of it rather than just someone who likes it was suited for success. Mm. Yet again, because it plays with the trope of the typical dressy fashioning episode and put it into a context that I could understand of, you know, being a creator and trying to create something that you're passionate about and (laughs) having it being completely ruined by other people. (laughs) You know, having to deal with the, uh, the, the pressures of trying to create something and being at the beck and call of others at the same time. But there have been a lot of episodes since then that have not quite knocked it off its top spots, but certainly come close to it. Lunar Eclipsed, Bab Seed, oddly enough, I really quite like. And of this season, yeah, there's been quite a lot of really strong episodes in there. Pinky Pride, um, oh gosh, which is the one with the uh, with Scootaloo and Learning... Uh, basically try to overcome her uh, her disability. Uh, wow. The... Flight to the Finish. That's the one. I really liked that one, even though I can't remember the title. <laughs> uh, it's okay. And how did you become a fan of the show? Uh, well, I pretty much explained it. Um, I think it was, well, 
to give it greater context, I saw it coming up around about the uh, the back end of season one. Everyone was going on about it, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a try. And I watched the first episode, and it was like, yeah, this is bad. It's still kind of girly. Um, and then I carried on watching it, and um, yeah, I was hooked by Suited for Success, and... Um, yeah, in terms of what my friends have reacted to in, in that regard, some of them are already actually, you know, watchers of the show. A few of them just shake their heads, but I've got some quite open-minded friends, and we're all animation geeks, so um, we all love certain aspects of cartoons or uh, or anime or whatever different thing each of them happen to be into. So it's just all part of the great myriad of weird that happens to compose my, my peer group. <laughs> yeah, I can understand. I have the same things too, where I told a friend I like ponies, they were like, really? Yeah. And then we both think about it and then like, oh yeah, we like Killer Kill, so yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and thanks for answering the question, Hazel. And Beth, what about you? Favorite character, favorite episode? Favorite character, I always tend to say Pinkie Pie, but I have a soft spot for vinyl as, as well. My favorite episode is a difficult one, though. I have so many different ones I really enjoy. Well, if you have a hard time answering one, just name a whole season. <laughs> I don't know. I'd like lots of different ones from all of them. Oh, my. <laughs> it's difficult to choose. Yeah. Let's just say all of them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good place to start. <laughs> Yay. Yay. And how did you become a fan of the show? I stumbled across the fandom by completely by accident before I even found out about the show. Oh. At the time, I was looking for inspiration to do some Spyro fan art. And I stumbled across this artist who's called Citra360. And I started following his stuff and started dropping by his live streams. He's like, oh, he's drawing ponies. What's all this about? So I guess I just kept going back because I like, enjoyed watching the artwork and then I started getting curious about the show so I started looking into it and just started watching it hmm. right from the beginning okay. so I kind of fell across the fandom before I found the show oh, okay that's interesting so um, have you ever been a fan of the show before the fourth generation I know I used to, I know I used to have the toys when I was little I don't I think either the G1 or G2 toys I had when I was little but other than that not really oh okay so, just a toy friend then. Okay. And what do your family and friends think about your love for the show? Um, I don't know if my family fully, fully realise yet. <laughs> it's like, I've got all my blind bag ponies on top of my computers, but they've never, like, asked about it. So, I don't know. But hmm. my best friend, my best, my best friends, they're okay with it. They quite often just ask what's going on and how everybody I know is. Okay. That, that's a fascinating story. <laughs> and thank you, Beth, for answering the questions. Good there. And thank you all for answering them. And now we can move on to the next topic. And the next topic is housekeeping. Just like last year, we did an award for you guys to vote for. Pick the best out of the best and vote for your favorite personalities. Links can be found in the show notes. So if you're clicking it right now, you can vote for best host, funniest host, and so on. If you have a person in mind that you want to vote for, Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, James Cork, all sketchy sounds, do vote for them. And with that, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic is news time. And sketchy, why don't you take this one? I think this is really relatable for you. I would say it is. So, in the news today, Buck 2014 tickets are available now. Uh, there's a link in the show notes to the article on Equestria Daily. Uh, if you head on over to the BuckCon website itself, you can now purchase tickets for Buck 2014. They are finally selling their tickets. Early bird tickets are available in limited numbers for £65, which is an extremely good price for all the amazing stuff that's going to be happening there. Uh, standard tickets will be £80 after the early bird rate expires. But if you want to get more out of your convention experience, then you should try the 20% cooler ticket. In this package, you will receive a complimentary buffet lunch with guests, exclusive t-shirt and a poster for £190. If you want to get the maximum book experience, though, and, you know, contribute even more towards the con itself, then you should go for the Celestia ticket. That comes with all the perks that you got from the 20% cooler ticket, and 
you'll get the chance to mingle with the book VIP guests and a ticket for the Summer Sun Celebration Concert at low, low price of £335. Again, links can be found in the show notes. You want to head over to buckcon.org to find the tickets. And I would say that's a fairly relevant item to ourselves, seeing as myself and our guests today are all members of the team that runs the uh, Tumblr for their mascot. Anyway, moving to our next bit of news. Fighting is Mad like a tribute edition is out now. Um, a while back, the crew responsible for Fighting is Mad like were given a C&D notice from Hasbro's legal team. After shutting down Fighting is Mad like, however, they did move on to another project, and Lauren Faust is in their team for that. So that is going to be an amazing, absolutely amazing piece of work. But... Not wanting to abandon Fighting is Magic and the amazing work that had already been done with it, uh, a group of fans gathered together and uh, finished up the game, or at least what was what there was of it. Now known as Fighting is Magic Tribute Edition, uh, it features bug fixes, some tweaks, and a functioning set of characters to play, along with multiplayer play as well. So you, again, you can find that from links in the show notes. So this bug, I. Can't wait. Seriously, I am planning to go to this year's Buck. And from the guest list that you guys have mentioned, yay, can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be pretty awesome. We're going to have, you know, musicians, artists, writers from all over the community. There's going to be the Summer Sun Celebration. The venue this year is bigger as well. We're in a different venue this year. Um, Buck... Uh, last year was held at the Bridgewater, Ho- the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester. This year, it's all going to be in the Manchester Central uh, venue, which is the place that the Summer Sun Celebration was held in last year. Uh, anyone who was there last year for the Summer Sun Celebration knows how vast that venue is and uh, how awesome the Summer Sun <laughs> Celebration was. So if you don't want to miss out, then uh, make sure you grab yourself a ticket and head over to Buck. It will be possibly one of the best experiences of your life. Oh, true, true. I'm trying to go there, and maybe I'll opt for a 20% cooler ticket because, you know, you go to Buck only once, and if you don't take the full experience, you're cheating yourself out of a good experience. Mm-hmm. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And if you have the cash... Why not take Celestia? That would be awesome. Like Celestia, you can have your cake and eat it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yes, that is true. I wish I was rich enough for that. Uh, The plane ticket in the hotel is going to kill me. Uh, But still, but still. Meeting you guys for the first time would be awesome. It will be awesome. It will Mm -hmm. kick ass. Two out of three anyway. Well, you're not going? Unfortunately, no. Make it this year. Family stuff. It was a shame because last year she couldn't go either. Oh. At the year before that. It was a wedding last year. The year before that, I found out too late. And then yeah. this year, it's more family stuff. You know what? Move the family stuff to Buck. That makes sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> it difficult. But anyway, with the next news, Fighting's Magic, who here has played the leak version? I unfortunately have not. I'm not normally a fan of fighting games, but oh. I was I was disappointed to see the uh, what happened what happened with the C and D on it. So hearing that there is going to be a completed version might actually make me want to check it out and see if I can find it. Well, it's in the show notes in the link from Equestria Daily, and you know what? I've played with it, and it's fun. Um, the computer. Let's just say the computer does not give you chances. It plays rough. <laughs> the ponies treat you rough. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I thought I was the bad one. Where's James to control me? <laughs> <laughs> but th- th- this is a full-fledged game. It- it's really awesome. And you know what? If you've been clamoring for more fighting ponies, this is a good one to play. That's time to get your fix. Indeed. And moving on to the next topic, it's guest time. And in today's guest time, we have us Britannia. And how are you guys? I'm doing quite well. I'm good. I'm doing fairly well. <laughs> I'm just busy trying to make uh, breezy versions of our cast because someone asked yesterday. Oh, my. So, <laughs> and after the recent episode came out, I thought, yep, it's going to have to happen. Why don't I go ahead and introduce uh, our guests here? Um, so... 
Uh, with us today, we have uh, Hazel Hughes and uh, Bethy Boo. Um, Hazel is our main artist at Aspertania. He is the one responsible for producing um, the vast majority of the content that you see popping up on Aspertania every week. It's him that's, that's slaving away, shifting vectors around, putting ponies together, and so forth. Crystal slaves. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Beth is uh, another of our artists. She also does vector stuff, and she also makes animations for us. So, uh, for example, the recent Valentine's Day post where you saw all those uh, flirty ponies uh, fluttering their eyelashes at you, those are all her doing. Uh, also, so, also, so were the, uh, the duck-faced ponies that you saw recently. <laughs> those are also her doing, and she did a magnificent job of them. And any of the moving pictures of animations of Prince as well, Princess Prince. Yes, like the one where you could see the strings when you were flying. <laughs> so you're the one responsible for them. Mm, okay. Those giggles you had from those are her fault. <laughs> Good giggles, though. They're worth it. Yep. So how do you guys got involved with uh, Aspertania Tumblr? Bit of a long story on some accounts. Uh, in my case, I got... Um, I got involved probably right from the start of, of book uh, book 2012, where I made the um, I made a, a plush Britannia that sold at uh, that sold at auction, uh, the charity auction that they did. And while I was making the character, I started getting into thinking, "Oh, what would this character be like if I were to try and write her into like the actual show? You know, how does a a pony version of the UK, which is essentially what she is, actually work in the in the show while seeming believable and understandable and more than just a joke character. Mm-hmm. So I wrote a little bit of a fanfic, and that got featured in the book um, um, brochure, the, bro- the book uh, convention um, pamphlets that got given out, and likewise. Um, that was uh, sketchy sounds at the time. Was also running a competition for a fanfic based on Britannia. Well, so. that was, uh, the competition was um, it was at uh, Bug Twenty Twelve, and I'd been put in charge of uh, judging the well of helping judge the final entrance and reading out the winning entry. The reason I was put in charge of that is because at the time, um, well, I should just say in general, I was. Uh, Oh, I'd been brought in as a guest at the f- very first book because I was fairly well known as a musician and also an author and also a uh, an artist. And they brought me on for the uh, the fanfic competition because I was probably one of the main authors they knew about and reasonably prolific. So they were like, "Right, could you help judge this?" And you could put some sentences together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> now, it turned out to be Hazel's Swick that won that uh, contest. And uh, we then, later on, uh, after Buck was over, um, I was approached by Saturn. And he said, uh, would you be able and too interested in running um, a Tumblr for Britannia, for Ask Britannia? He was like, you know, <coughs> would you be able to, like, draw or whatever? And I was like, well, I suppose I could. Um, he was like, uh, and could you... He was like, you know, would you maybe be able to get in touch with Hazel and get him in on it as well? Now, this is the thing. Prior to this all occurring, I should mention the main reason why Hazel came to mind when I was approached with this was because prior to that, um, but just after about 2012... Uh, we'd chatted a bit together via UK of Equestria, and um, we'd said, you know, I'd basically said to him, uh, you know, I have this Royal Guard character who I think it'd be fun to try bouncing off of um, off of uh, Britannia, because, you know, that it strikes me that the two of them have some interesting personality traits that could both work well together, but also clash in some ways, and it'd be interesting to write a story on that. So we started getting to work on that, um, and then after we'd written quite a lot of that, um, was when I was contacted by Saturn and he said, you know, and I think it was after actually I'd let him read some of what we'd written. He was like, would you guys be interested in, you know, running a Tumblr for us with Britannia? And I was like, well, yes, I certainly would. And I said to him, you know, would you be interested? And he was like, hell yes. <laughs> um, 
had we known at the time how much work it would be, I don't know how enthusiastic we would have been. But, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and the decision was made, and, you know, we haven't really regretted it that much. Well, mm. so. Any regrets that you do feel in this are very often a case of either feeling a bit overworked, because there's a lot of content that has to be put out there, yeah. especially when you're competing with such a massive um, content-producing fandom, which is what the MLP one is. There seems to be pictures every... I mean, no sooner does an episode come out than someone's made a plush of one of the characters that's hit it. It's that mad in general, the MLP. Though we use the word competing in, well, you know, that can be put in inverted commas, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I would not say that I would consider it a competition, but when there's so much content out there, it sometimes feels like you are trying your best to make sure that the the work that you have is keeping up. With We're trying to get else. Senpai to notice us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> senpai being everybody else on the fandom. Yes. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was basically how we got hired for the project. And um, Beth was one of those who answered our call when we realized that the whole endeavor was more than what two, just two people could do. And we needed exactly some more now, artists. <laughs> what was that, I've been, Beth? I've been here pretty much exactly a year now. Just about, yeah. Um, I mean, it was roughly around a year ago that we put out a call saying, you know, we need more artists, etc., to help out with Ask Britannia. If you think you can help, then answer the call. You know, let, let us know. And Beth was one of the main folk that answered and produced some pretty damn good art. And, uh, you know, we were like, right, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you in and see what you can do. And Beth has consistently produced artwork for us almost pretty much every time that we've called on her and said, you know, can you do this for us? Can you do that for us? Can you can you do this? Would you be able to make that? Beth's done it, and she's been good at it. And also, what with the fact that she's the only artist currently that we have on the team who knows how to animate and who we can rely on to put animations together in a fairly short order, that's made her an invaluable asset and a permanent fixture here at uh, mm-hmm. the Aspertania team. Which makes it especially saddening that she can't come. <laughs> she's just so far managed to miss out on books so many times. Um, you didn't think I haven't really cried about that. <laughs> we are totally making it up for, this, up for it this year, though, because her birthday is like a week after Buck, so we, we are going to try and... Well, I shouldn't say we are going to try. We are going to get <laughs> our Tumblr team together and go and have some fun somewhere because it's not fair that she's got that she's had to miss out so many times. Mm. Like I said, family plans move it to Buck. <laughs> if only it was that easy. Uh, but anyway, um, from what you're telling me, the Us Britannia and Tumblr didn't start out at the same time as the convention, right? It was what you might call an afterthought almost. Mm. Um, and this is the thing. Uh, I would say that most likely what caused them to decide that they wanted to do one is the fact that, you know, other cons have done one. And two, of course, it's fairly well known that if you make an Ask Only Tumblr, then you're probably going to get some interest. If you if you do one that's a can character, you'll get a ton of interest. Um, if you do one that's a OC, you might not get as much interest, but if you do a good job, it, you'll still get a fair amount of interest and uh, followers. And Obviously, for a convention, then having you know a thousand or so people who are following a con- following a Tumblr that's linked to a convention through which you can then do some marketing and spread some news is very handy. That's looking at it from the business side of it, which is essentially what a convention is. We're there for the we're there for we're there for the attendees. We're there to have a good time, but at the same time, the con doesn't happen if it doesn't get people interested. It's that weird mix between fans coming together and doing something not for profit and just for the sake of the love of the show, but at the same time having to be really strict and on the ball with what, how you do it. So yeah, it started out as what is essentially a marketing project, but I like to write my characters with some, some weight to them. And um, what Aspirity is essentially about is about a, a royal guard in, in Equestria and there's aspects of sort of James Bond spy stuff going on. There's aspects of um, adventure things going on. 
I mean, we've got... Uh, currently, the way the blog is running at the moment is we've got uh, Captain Britannia of the Equestrian Royal Guard sorting out a problem whereby Cantalot has experienced some uh, some terrible and but mysterious flooding, something that quite a lot of the people in the UK at the moment will identify with, <laughs> owing to the fact that our, the entirety of our... Uh, of our southern counties seem to be uh, semi-submerged <laughs> at present. So that's just the framing device. And But the thing is, Britannia's been replaced by a fake alicorn lookalike, who, who somewhat turned up around about the time that a certain purple alicorn also became, <laughs> became a princess. So that's going on. And at the same time, we seem to have a bit of a... We have a mysterious hacker who has taken control of the blog and is trying to give us the goods on what really goes down in Equestria. So it's a bit of a mystery, a bit of a spy story, and we try and mix it up with some jokes and with some uh, some silly stuff, but uh, also a few little bits of, uh, of Equestrian World canon, just to make it more interesting. We've got a very loyal fan base with it who are constantly giving us... <laughs> constantly giving us headaches with their really good, <laughs> their really good questions and their uh, equally really silly questions. But I just want to know, hacker. Oh Sorry. gosh, who invited her? <laughs> um, you don't have to invite me. I find my way in on my own. Uh, did not invite Clarion. <laughs> Sweetie, you're supposed to control this. My security protocols have been overwritten. Oh, uh, boy, I need to change my antivirus then. But I, I was reading the whole Tumblr because as a homework that I was trying to do, I've created a device where I can talk to the Tumblr police. Still in the works, but still, um, I've mm. seen a few stories where um, Britannia was selected as the, well, butt of a joke. And moving mm. on from there, to me from what I read, it's a really interesting story and I wish I was there from the beginning to read all of them from the start. It is one of those where we've tried to put out content every week, but as it's been going for over a year now, it's become huge and because everyone asks such in-depth questions um, about things that's not necessarily we ever considered... For example, it's recently been revealed, spoilers, that Princess Britannia is being played by Fleur de Lis, a, uh, a certain elegant, um, Cantalot-based um, mare, a unicorn of, um, of French origins from the, uh, from the province of France. And um, so people have been asking how it is that she came to be here, what kind of acting jobs has she had in the past. And so... We've had to look into that, and we've had to start to, you know, sort out that she. Of course, she's uh, she's been in productions in the past. She's been in the Stallion of the Opera. She's been in Le Mers. Um, she's done a lot of work in in musical theatre. So that's the reason why she got picked for this job. But and this is the thing: our, our fan base are amazingly prescient sometimes and very observant, but at the same time maddeningly so, because it means we actually have to do some work for it, <laughs> rather than just get on with our story. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you have a really good fan base. And I was wondering about that, an Alicorn OC that looks like Britannia and can fly, but what's that rope doing around her? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but all in all, I, um, I do like the story and where it's going. It pulls you in and makes you ask questions. <laughs> it's one of those where I have taken, you know, quite valid critique that it's very difficult to get into from the start, but uh, from, you know, from just a casual glance. But not being, of course, a reader, I am the writer and the, and the artist, um, I do rely on quite a lot of feedback from our, from our fans to know where, uh, you know, whether they've got what we've been talking about or not, or whether they need further elaboration. And for that purpose, I have to admit, even though she can be the most annoying pain in the world sometimes, Clarion is very useful. <laughs> she can help explain. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> so how's the best way to read Us Britannia? Because um, I see a button here where it says just the story or read from the start. And... Mm. When I press read from the start, it's just a few pages. Oh, it shouldn't be. I mean, uh, when, when I mean a few pages, it's like seven or eight, but still. 
seven or eight stories of it. So I'm sounds, just double checking that actually because that might be a coding problem on my half. No, no, uh, seven <laughs> sounds about right. If you if you selected if you selected just the story, then it's about eight pages worth. Um, but every one of those eight pages is, is you know somewhere in the region of twenty or so posts. So there's still there. I mean that's what roughly 160 posts, um, if not more. Mm. Um, but yeah for uh, preference I would go for the read from the start I mean there's a little feature I'm going to be integrating shortly which is I'm going to divide it into chapters so it doesn't mean that you have to start rolling through and hunting for the where exactly you left off last time but uh, it's one of those things that's been on the to-do list and there's a lot of stuff on that to-do list the to-do list is bigger than the blog itself <laughs> <laughs> well you need this life I guess mm-hmm so, yes, I would advise if anyone wants to start off reading from the start, if you go to the main page, there's a little button down there which says uh, read from the start, and below that is just the story posts. Now, just the story posts will be just the story posts, the ones that have been tagged that are relevant to the story itself. Mm. Read from the start takes you right to the beginning of those posts as well. So it means that for those who are new to it, they can catch up with everything that's been that's happened, and then if they just want to read the story itself and aren't all in that interested in any of the fan art or any of the little uh, stuff about the blog, uh, stuff about the convention that will pop up, um, then they can just press that. Uh, uh, um, okay. But there are little things that we sneak into those posts that are relevant to the story as well. It's very much a blog that rewards those who delve, those who want to dig in and find out things. I mean, I've got a whole cluster of those right at the bottom with Clarion Call's head cannons, where we asked a load of people to submit what they thought about the uh, the world that we're depicting and how it differs from uh, from the Equestria we're all used to seeing on the, on the show or in other Ask blogs. And um, so that's a good way to sort of stick all those in as well. Little clandestine hacker that she is. Okay. So maybe I'm ignorant, but is Ask hmm. Britannia the only running mascot Tumblr blog out there? Uh, no. Um, no. There's, no. There's uh, Bronicon has one, um, which is their three mascot ponies. I don't it's... know if it's still running or receiving updates at the moment. It does update. Uh, the story that went along with that uh, completed in quite quick succession. It wasn't really so much... It started out in pretty much the same way that we did with asks directly to the mascots. And then it just turned into a, a story thing. And it was done by Petty Rep, the guy who does Rainbow Dash Presents. Um, and uh, the... Ooh, what else has he done? Yeah, he's mostly done... Um, uh, he's done a few other things, but he does Rainbow Dash Presents, and it's all done in his particular art style. Um, there's also Brony Can, uh, at the Canadian Brony Convention, that also has an Ask blog called... I think it's either Ask Brony Can or just Brony Can. And that's about their mascot, uh, Princess Apricity. Mm. Gosh, there's a glut of princesses out there, I <laughs> swear. <laughs> you're a princess, you're a princess, we're all princesses. <laughs> what were you saying, Beth? <laughs> I thought Apricity was the only official princess mascot. Yes, yeah, she's the only official princess mascot. So, well, um, there's also a Japanese um, pony princess. Um, if I'm there really... is, yes, I believe. But the way I see things now, um, there's a lot of OCs being thrown around with all the conventions. And I, I feel that's a good thing. You get more personality out of the standard conventions. I mean, that's what I wanted to aim for in any case. I mean, the convention is the heart of what we're creating, of course. The entire blog is essentially about the convention and trying to run a blog for a convention right at its heart. I mean, we if we go over to the, the storyline that's running along with Princess Britannia, we've got the... It's more about the crew who are behind the, the scenes trying to put it together. There's uh, the Sketchy Sounds is Ono C, who is called Sketchy Sounds, <laughs> oddly <laughs> enough. <laughs> there's my Ono C, uh, After Eight. Uh, there's... Um, Saturn and um, Mavs OCs, who were the, both who were both the the previous and former chairman and the current chairman, who are currently playing the role of the villain of the piece. But uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say whether that reflects anything about them. They're actually wonderful people in real life. Um, I have been told to say that. 
<laughs> oh my. But they're playing the meddling executives or and the slightly suspicious government officials who are actually who are uh, who are controlling the whole thing. And um that's about that's about their that's their story. They're just trying to put together this this blog for the convention and encountering all the kinds of difficulties that they do in a studio situation, particularly mm-hmm. with Fleur de Lis, who is the biggest diva who ever put on a fake pair of wings and a fake <laughs> helmet. So <laughs> Um, and meanwhile, we also have Britty and her, her loyal squadron of uh, Royal Guards who are currently trying to uh, unblock the, uh, the blockage which has stopped up Cantalot's draining system and causing all the flooding. Um, so we've got a couple of, a couple of the characters in there are all XPs from the, the blog, the story that me and Sketchy were writing, um, who came about as a result of just trying to put together a group of royal guards who seemed more um, more appropriate for their role in the uh, in the equestrian armed forces than just simply wearing a golden armor and and standing around looking important, except for when everything goes wrong. In which case, nope, call in the the elements of harmony. We're completely <laughs> useless. <laughs> no, in our version, the royal guards actually do have some reason to exist and to be a, uh, a an intelligent and useful part of Equestria's uh, defense. But um, still, that's what the the elements of harmony are there for a reason, of course. And so, they're not all powerful, our royal guards, but they try their best and they do their duty. And well, I do find the Astumbler fascinating, and with the mm. characters that you have, it is really entertaining. <laughs> I mean, my favourite of the um, of the the extended cast of our team happens to be our um, our little um, Britannia's uh, little servant, her aide to Camp, aide to Camp, who uh, who looks after her and makes her tea, and uh, makes sure that she's spick and span while also being rather a messy little pony himself, uh, Private Butler. <laughs> he's got a very co- he's got a an, he's got a difficult Cockney accent, is what he has. Um, the sort of accent that you wouldn't necessarily hear on a, a on an episode of uh, My Little Pony, but would be probably very recognisable to those kind of people who grew up watching British uh, TV, um, <laughs> particularly if they ever watched an episode of the comedy series Blackadder, <laughs> which has uh, inspired quite a lot of um, quite a lot of the dialogue and jokes in the in the. <laughs> I do love watching Blackadder. He's so evil. Mm. <laughs> so, who are the guys responsible for the character designs and so on? Like, I see mm. in the front page That's... alone, at the background, you have a lot of characters like Britannia, yeah. Spelt, and uh, Butler, and so on. And who's responsible for those? The design of the various characters is somewhat of a collaborative effort. Um, Britannia herself obviously was designed by the convention way before we ever got our, our hands on her. She was designed as an idea by the convention as to how she would look. But for the rest of the characters that you see, um, Sketchy, After Eight, Spelt, uh, <clears throat> Avalanche, Nutcracker, Mercy, Starbright, Flashbang, and the whole lot, every other character you see in there other than Britannia was either mine or Hazel's idea. Uh, in some cases, they're a combination of both. Uh, the textbook example of that would by far and away be Svelte. Um, <laughs> because... Just for context, uh, Svelte is the commander of Luna's Night Guard in our universe. Um, she's your typical, almost like a bit of a parody ha- uh, hammer horror vampire, like, bat pony um she's got a um she's got a um a stereotypical german accent um she's rather rather outgoing um and she is britannia one of britannia's commanders um you know yeah. one of her head honchos but she's she's got a big personality of her her own to the extent where we try and keep her off the screen as much as possible before <laughs> before she eats all the scenery <laughs> that's felt it so the way that uh, Svelte came about was that he was originally very his idea. But you see, then at some point when, uh, you know, Skelly came in and had a look, he was like, well, 
you know, I really like the idea you've got going here. I like the way you've designed that. And uh, it was an interesting thing, so when she was first visualized, I was like, you know, that looks good and all the short hair there. I can put the, have you maybe considered like giving her the big, vivacious long hair, you know, like, like the classic, almost like the vampirella thing. Mm. So we did that and it looked good on her. It really looked really good. But the real major thing, I suppose, but we, one day when, uh, when we were just talking together, the uh, Aspartame Tumblr group, we were just having an ash together. And I was like, you know what? And I was like, I've got this voice changer thing. I was just playing around with it. And I'd done a few different voices at the time. The main thing I was doing with it was doing like a sort of Princess Celestia voice with it. And I was like, you know, I wonder if I could do Svelte's voice with this. So I slightly modified it a bit, changed a few settings. And I ended up with this voice. And I was like, you know, this isn't quite it. I was like, you know, it really needs the accent, doesn't it? So... Then I started speaking with this accent and this certain manner of speech, and I was like, well, hello there. My name is Kansas Ferdianko Filimila von Nocturne, and it is an absolute pleasure to make your acquaintance. <laughs> and we grew from there. Um, and it has to be said, you know, ever since then, it was like, once I had done that, and once I started doing that, I think it was, Hazel was just like, I honestly cannot see her any other way now. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. To the point where if we ever managed to do a full animated feature or anything like that, Sketchy has essentially got her speaking voice. <laughs> Indeed. I'm not sure how he is singing in that particular oh, voice, God. but um, certainly speaking. And um, it certainly worries your ever-free regulars whenever you uh, start speaking in that voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like all kinds of people. The, you know, the funniest thing is when I start talking with this voice, and you know, when it is people that don't know to me too, too well, and they're like, oh, who is that? She sounds absolutely delicious. And then I'm just like, oh, that's me. <laughs> 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 Uh, I, I've heard that voice a few times on James's stream, and no, me knowing that it's you kind of confused me. Let's just say that that voice has a personality of its own. Well, I mean, that's the aspect of any good voice for any good character. It should take on life of its own, so that you, you know, so that you don't think of it as the person behind it. You think of it as the character themselves, and. If Svelte's voice has taken on such a character to the extent that she can, that her voice is almost dissociated with me, then that's good because that means you're just hearing her for who she is rather than hearing her as some dude with a voice changer. Oh, that is true, that is true. It's almost like Mark Helmer playing the Joker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Quite a lot of our characters are, they benefit from having their own personal voice, or at least they do in my head when I'm writing them. I mean, Britannia is your typical upper class. Uh, the the kind of British voice that you might expect if you watch rather a lot of Downton Abbey, for instance, um, with a, a little bit of uh, "Come on, chaps, get on with it" sort of aspect to it. And when she's been you, when she's been voiced in the actual promotions and that, the uh, the wonderful Isla Mon- Monty has usually done her voice for her. Um, she started out rather too close to being the rather like the Queen, but um, we, we quickly told her that that wasn't what she was. Um, but there's a variety of accents our characters have that we use to try and make them sound a little bit more unique. Uh, Avalanche, for example, has what British people would recognise as being a very broad, northern a very uh, Yorkshire accent. A dialect to him, it sounds like this. You know, you would half expect him to be like, Hey, up, my duck. How's it going? Shall we go down? Bob, have a couple of pints. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas some others are more, I suppose, what the American audience would consider to be, inverted commas, normal accents. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, Equestria is a very varied place when it comes to the voices that the ponies have. Um, My favorite thing- even though quite a lot of them seem to come from some portion of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> The thing is how Rose Quartz ended up being Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's an interesting question I have you get for you guys. So, in in the story here, the crew for As Britannia, they're from Britain? I mean, this is the thing. Um, the Aspartania, the, the, the folks that are in Aspartania, the characters that you see there, 
None of them are in the slightest bit British, other than the fact that Britannia has the name Britannia, which I suppose would make her British. We <laughs> actually made about that some time back. But no, um, the characters that you see in As Britannia, uh, they are no more British than we are equestrian, in that they do not come from Britain, as it were. However... The blog is nevertheless written by British people, and uh, the characters therein nevertheless do reflect certain aspects of British culture and thinking. As one, partly as a result of the writing, but two, because you know we like to believe, um, you know, narcissistic human beings that we are, that culture reflects in some ways our own culture. You know, our own human culture. So. You do still find ponies that will speak in certain ways that have accents that sound very similar to certain British ones or other places from Earth, you know, other countries' accents. There are a few other ponies in there that sound like they're from various other places. Like, for example, there's at least there's at least one Australian, um, and uh, there's at least... Australian. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Australian. <laughs> and there's, there's at least one American-sounding one, um, and there's a few others as well, so... It's a very cosmopolitan cast we've got. I mean, this is the thing. You've got, you know, you've got Britannia, who sounds all plummy and British and, well, stereotypically British, I suppose is the word. Um, you've got, you know... It's felt with her you know, exotic East European sounding accent. Uh, you've got Freeze Pop, who um, sounds Icelandic. You've got, and then you've got, you know, Britannia Squad, who sound like they're from... They're handpicked from all over parts of Britain and, in one or two cases, other parts of the world as well. It's there to give a lot of variety to the place, because, of course, the the map that we are all aware of, of Equestria, that has been uh, published by um, by Hasbro, by DHX, by the big team, um, it, it seems very... It seemed, it seemed very small to me when I saw it, and I like to think that what that is is the equivalent of the kids' colouring book version of Equestria, <laughs> that we haven't been shown the full range. Because in the show, they talk about places like... Uh, they make reference to a sort of French-sounding place. Um, a, a character turns up, I think it's... Uh, C- uh, Uncle Apple Strudel or Cousin Apple Strudel or something like that, who's wearing the Alpine garb, and I'm thinking there has to be a part of Equestria that's kind of Swiss or, or German or something like that. So we've never pinpointed exactly where these places are, but we've kind of envisioned that our cast come from different parts of Equestria and that they somehow have got aspects to them that are close to this real wo- uh, to as, our as real world. It's sum it up. Mm. The way it's up is that we haven't pinned down exactly where these places are, but we know they exist and that these ponies are from those places. Mm. <laughs> Just to avoid any uh, confusion, all of the cast that you see on the blog are equestrians. They're just not necessarily the kind that we would see on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Buckler. I don't think Buckler would be able to be allowed on set. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, it's understandable because you made your Tumblr so believable that it carries its own personality that this person is from this place, is that person's from that place. And I'm just wondering, where in Equestria are they? Uh, are they from Paris? or I, I don't know what's the equivalent for the United Kingdom for Equestrian. Mm. Well, Britty herself is from Cantalot, which is the closest one that we've actually found in the show that you could be that you could actually describe as being, you know, like the United Kingdom. All the ponies there, apart from, say, for example, Twilight or Shining Armor, seem to have these rather up, upper class British accents to them um, <laughs> at times. And Cantalot itself is a play on words with Camelot, the uh, the fiction, the uh, the 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 kingdom of uh, of King Arthur, who you know, it's very easy to forget, is actually a um, a British folkloric figure. So Cantalot has sort of become the home, uh, so sort of become the home for Br- uh, for Britty's upper class uh, land owning side of her family. Uh, but she's also got uh, the other half of her family is from uh, the equivalent of Scotland 
uh, which we've called Trotland because we love puns and are terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so that's somewhere up in the up in some undistinct highlands, and it's filled with locks that may or may not be filled with monsters. It's and locks, they, they, locks. Not locks. locks. Well, you'd be best off talking about it, wouldn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah jock. You. It's, it's the world of Equestria. Monsters do exist, so yeah. <laughs> the way that I envision Equestria being is it's essentially the entirety of a Dungeons and Dragons book emptied out into some magical fantasy land that has an almost Terry Pratchett like take on, you know, mirroring our world while also being very different to our world. So you'll have a place which is, it looks to all intents and purposes like Paris, but it's not because it's not Paris and it's not France, but there is a thing that looks like the Eiffel Tower, except it's got a giant bowl and cherries on it. Oh, wait, it's the Trifle Tower. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's an actual joke that we made in a recent update. Uh, I've seen the picture. I've seen the picture. <laughs> Yeah, it's named. This is the funny thing with that uh, that picture. Um, it tells you that, that that tower is called La Tour Bagatelle. Um, if you go and translate that, you get the Trifle Tower. <laughs> well, Bagatelle means little. It's like a little thing, so it's a trifle in, a, in the other sense of the word. Ah, but, right. Uh, but it's a play on words. It's a pun. <laughs> it's uh, a pun in French. <laughs> oh, you guys. But then again, it, we can't exactly be blamed for our puns. They get those... <laughs> the, the show itself is full of puns. Oh. I mean, Philadelphia, <laughs> Manhattan, oh, really. <laughs> I mean, that was a joke in the first ever... Uh, one of the first ever things was that uh, Britannia got told that um, the, pla- the, the place uh, where the book was being held was in Manchester. And she's there saying, oh, Manchester, because they're humans. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I, I read that. funny. <laughs> I read that, yes. So, um, a question for Beth. What inspires you to do your animations? Because um, obviously there's a script handed out to you and you do them. And with the latest one, I'm, I guess, is the Valentine's Day. How did that come about? Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, I think it was just because someone linked the, the Rainbow Dash to it. And I was like... Hmm, what would what would I think it was either Clarion or Svelte look like doing this, and it kind of went from there. Spiraled from there is the term. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Spiraled. And likewise, there was one time when you uh, when you asked, oh, the, this was when the bats episode had just come out. Oh yes, once, and because she had the animation stills for doing, you know, the the bat wing flying. Uh, she wanted to do one for Svelte. And it's like, I so want to do a flying. It. Yeah, and so we integrated that into the uh, into that particular post. So um, mm. it's the wonderful things about the animations is that it's not really something. There are times when we do ask Beth to do an animation for us, but most of the time she just does them on herself because it's presumably like, I think she this just... is funny. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That and it's Tumblr. Everyone loves gifts on Tumblr. Oh, that is Most true. of Tumblr is gifts. <laughs> gift, 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 gift. Oh, that, that is true. Everybody loves the gifts, and gifts are really entertaining. And also joining us late is James Cork. Hello, hello. Sorry for the delay. I was busy watching a movie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, you toaster. Oh, don't, don't fight, don't fight. But anywho, James. In news time, we talk about Buck 2014. Tickets are available now. And also, Fighting East Magic Tribute Edition is out now. So, those are the things that we mentioned in the previous news time. So, if you have the chance, go read it up or anything like that. But right now, we're interviewing Us Britannia's Tumblr team. And if you have any questions to ask them, do ask them now, James. Oh, sure. Is there anything well, to ask us? Uh, well, uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, what process did you guys follow when it comes to uh, come up with ideas? Like, um, do you like write down? Like, does it come out? Uh, does it come like uh, ba- uh, ba- randomly a, a sudden burst of inspiration, or do you actually sit down and spend hours and hours thinking about what to draw and uh, how to do it? Yes. <laughs> 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 Oh, uh, sometimes I get the impression that all they do is keep quiet and just let me get on with my madness. Chaos <laughs> <laughs> is the best way of putting it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a mix of things. Um, there are ideas. I mean, often it's 
often Hazel comes up with things and then doesn't tell me he's come up with them until he's already done them. Um, it's the general way things seem to operate, which he shouldn't really be doing, but it's what he does anyway. Uh, but usually it's a case of we have a think about where we need to go with stuff and then think about how we're going to get there, and then we end up getting half a dozen really well-thought-out questions which send us flying off on tangents in every which uh, way. Uh, and then once we finally dealt with those, we finally pick up and get back to where we were actually meant to be going several months down the line and after we, when we actually intend to do it. This isn't an intentional process, by the way, <laughs> but it is just something that happens. I mean, example... Last night, someone sent us a question saying, draw Ask Britannia cast as Breezies. Oh, God. And I looked at it and I thought, no, stuff you. And then the episode came out and I thought, must draw Freezy Breezy. (laughs) (laughs) So that's what's happening right now. (laughs) Even though it's completely unnecessary to the story and it's time that should be spent actually progressing with the story, it's appropriate and it's something that people will like and find funny. And at the end of the day, that's kind of the way it is. A lot of it is just a case of we have a vague general direction of where we're going and what plot points need to be covered and then something turns up. So then we have to cover that as well or choose not to. Not canon to the story. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. They're not canon to the story in this. It's just we will make a point of saying whether it's canon or non-canon. Um, <laughs> and come on. Britannia turning into a breezy. And we are not amused. I was going to say, and come on, you know, breezy freezy sounds too funny not to do. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like uh, its natural pathway to like, come on, guys, you have to do that. It's in the I name. mean, it's the same with the duck faces the, when uh, when that particular episode came out. Just Which particular some... episode? Uh, There's been a duck face in every episode this season so far. The, the duck the face. The AJ duck face, that was. The one with the supreme Applejack duck face. <laughs> ah, okay. Because you, you saw the uh, duck faces we had for that, did you not? I did. Simple ways, I did. Isn't it? Yeah. It was. Meanwhile, all the Britty was contributing towards that was the subtly raised eyebrow. <laughs> say, really? Doesn't it seem like kind of fitting for her to be, uh, yeah, it's like, oh, God, you people. <laughs> Pretty much. And ponies. Bless her, she is, she is not exactly the, per- the kind of pony who would be your typical mascot. Um, she's difficult. She can be... Oh, so hoity-toity at times when she wants to. She speaks as if she swallowed a thesaurus. Um, she's... Dorothy, did I hear someone call my name? <laughs> <laughs> but she's... She tries her best, bless her. And she's trying to... And she does it because it's... You know, it's what's built into her. She she does her duty. And if, if this is something that she's been duty-bound to do, that's what she's going to do. It's just such a shame that she's having to deal with, well, us writing her and um, and the uh, the difficulties of, uh, of the dreaded executive meddling. That can't be easy. <laughs> but she'll, uh, she'll win out in the end. She always does. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a knack of hers to be able to pull herself out of some difficult situation. Hmm, okay. <laughs> so um, I've been noticing a few things. When you told me that um, As Britannia started after the first convention... So, mm-hmm. do you guys follow a storyline where um, this year's convention, say the 2013 convention, follows this story for that year and moving on to the 2014, it follows another story? Do you do that? or? Um, but my, 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 if uh, if we had um, the time and the manpower and the capability to follow, like you know, to have like one story arc, as it were, per per con season, that would be wonderful, and we probably would do something like that. But in reality, excuse me, in reality, the way it's turned out is that um, we just have one continuous contiguous storyline as as uh, Hazel has said 
simply because we as writers, me and Hazel are writers both, we're more used to working in that sort of fashion. So we, we have worked the way that we're more comfortable with. So when it comes to the to the creative effort, which one which one is the first one to come up with the ideas? Is, is it usually like, oh, I have an idea for a picture and then you work the story around it, or oh, I have a, an idea for a story and then you work a picture around it? It goes it's, space. Yeah, mostly the latter. It has to be said because the story takes paramount, and then we sort of work the story. Uh, we work the pictures through it. Um, uh huh. But on occasion, we'll come up with a particular picture and uh, decide to take it in, in the, along that, those lines. Yeah. Heck, I'm, example would be the, the Trifle Tower. That was um, that <laughs> horrible pun idea that I suddenly came up with out of the blue and Hazel's like, that's so brilliant, I'm going to draw it. <laughs> <laughs> it was because we'd received quite a lot of questions about uh, Fleur and her acting career and, you know, what it meant. And a couple of questions saying, well, if Fleur is supposed to represent France, maybe she's having a go at Britannia because she's British. And we wanted to kind of try, sort of turn that idea off. This is Equestria. We haven't got French ponies having a go at British ponies. That would be silly. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's some other reason behind it, but still, um, as a, a in a way, we want. I wanted to present it, and I, I remember saying, "Oh gosh, now I've got to draw something French, haven't I?" <laughs> and then, and then Sketchy, and then said, "What would the friend, What would the pony version of the Eiffel Tower look like?" And Sketchy said, "It'd be pink." And I was like, "Yeah, it'd be pink and have a cherry on top, and it would be the." And I was like, "Because it would be the Trifle Tower," and everyone lost it at that point. <laughs> <laughs> And that's pretty much a good... Uh, sometimes it's, it really is a case of we'll have an idea and then some little notion will blossom and become something much bigger than it has any right to be. Um, for example, the character of Slightly Eccentric. Um, Slightly Eccentric is uh, one, of our, um, one of our VOCs of one of the book. Uh, staff, Ruth. She, uh, what what is it that Ruth does again? She's like publicity manager, isn't she? Or is that Graham? No, she she doesn't run all the publicity. She just runs some of the online publicity. She manages the Facebook. Um, And she is a lovely person. She's, uh, she is a bit nuts, (laughs) it has to be said. But uh, she's a very nice person. And uh, we decided with her character, slightly eccentric, that she would basically live up to her name. And... Basically, everything we've done with her so far, when we've shown it, when we've then shown what we've done with with her to Ruth, she's been in stitches. Um, she even came up with one of the gags that, uh, or at least approved one of the gags that we gave her when we had at one point when um, when Princess Britannia in a rage had said to uh, says to slightly eccentric, "Are you brain damaged or something?" Uh, then the very next update, you see slightly eccentric saying quietly. Brain damage my second cousin <laughs> twice removed. Oh. <laughs> Horse pants ventral. Oh wow. Yeah, but yeah, she's just she's just a she's a delight to write because she has n- there's well the clue is in the name slightly eccentric. Nearly anything goes with her. Um, I mean, there's one particular moment where she's talking at length about the brutal tortures enacted towards uh, uh, towards Guy Fawkes when we were doing that particular special, and she just turns around to uh, to Princess Britannia and goes, "Isn't that cool?" <laughs> and the idea is, oh, she's probably some sort of murderous psychopath. She isn't. She's just one of those people who gets really, really enthusiastic about you know mad little facts. <laughs> You know, those kind of, kind of quietly dangerous people who know everything about everything to do with trains or something Uh-oh. like that. She's just one of those little obsessives. And she's, she's the resident British uh, researcher for the team. So it allows us to make some silly little jokes about our own, uh, our own country as well. Because wow. that's something that the Brits like to pride themselves that we're very good at. We're good at taking the mick out of ourselves and uh, showing how ridiculous some aspects of our culture can be. Okay. So, so you obviously have a quite a big uh, team uh, working on this Tumblr. What is the most difficult thing and the, the 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 most arduous task about coordinating so many people? Well, it's not really that many people. There's like, I mean, at the core of the at the core of it. There is really four of us that are active most of the time. That's myself, Hazel, Beth, and uh, Mecca. Um, 
that, with that said, our, our core team is currently more like six people because we do have two additional vector artists, but they're not as active or as involved as Hazel or Beth are. Um, I would say the biggest challenge with it really is just making sure that everyone is on the same page. I mean, there are times when, we, when we've done stuff in the past, there have been times when we've been like, okay, who's doing this, who's doing that, and so forth. This is one of the reasons actually why we cut it down from as many people as it was, because there was a point when we had a group, which I think still exists but isn't used anymore, we had a group filled with about maybe 20-odd people, all of whom had said that they could, you know, contribute towards the blog. Um, but the problem with doing things that way was that out of those 20 people, there were maybe eight or nine that could be relied on with any degree of uh, regularity to actually get stuff done in a timely fashion. The rest of them, you know, they would do stuff for us, but we had to really be constantly pushing at them to do it and constantly reminding them. And that's just not efficient when you're wanting to get a storyline written and and pushed forward and completed. You can't be wasting time on chasing people up to get tasks done that you asked them to have done two weeks ago because you're just going to end up delaying yourself. And and if you have to do that for, like, five different people, it's not going to work. So It's one of those unfortunate things where most people who run uh, Ask Blogs are essentially doing so for fun or they're doing so because they like the community or that they want to better their art or they want to tell a story. And, you know, that's kind of why we're here as well. But at the same time, because we are on the, we're on the demands of, you know, essentially trying to promote the convention at the same time, it becomes almost like a, it becomes like trying to work for a production company. You've got deadlines you've got to read, that you've got to meet. You've got to uh, make sure that everybody's communicating and understanding and that uh, if you say that you're going to do something, you've got to do it. And we took on quite a few people who have either joined for a period of time, found that it wasn't for them, and then ended up leaving. Or um, I don't think there's anyone we've ever actually let go but there has certainly been some people who have chosen of their own volition no longer to be part of the project because, you know, they, they've got their own... Um, they've got their own priorities that they need to focus on, which is, of course, perfectly reasonable. You know, none of us are being paid for this. That's the other uh, thing that does make it different. We're doing this purely voluntarily for our sins, so... <laughs> uh, uh, do you do you follow uh, a specific criteria or uh, a pattern when it comes to picking people to work for uh, for Ask Britannia, or do they come to you guys and you like make them go through a selection process or something, or do you just like uh, follow someone's career and say, yeah, I want this guy to work for the blog. Let's see if they are available. It's a bit of all of those things. Um, the I mean, sorry, it did it was. You did a test when I started, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. When uh, when we brought Beth on, that was that was when we'd first done a recruitment run of people saying, you know, we need people who can help us with this. So Beth, you know, contacted us in regards to that, and she passed our test fairly easily. I mean, the test itself was nothing special. It was basically just a case of we would give them a limited asset sheet um, to use with Thingscape and say, right, you know pick a scene from the blog and recreate it, or maybe even make one of your own. Um, and Beth did that pretty darned easily. In Beth's case, it was a case of, yeah, she responded specifically to something. But it's not always like that, because in some cases, it's, uh, it's the case of sometimes we get some very enthusiastic people who will contact us and say, I would really like to help you out with this. I think Mecca would be the biggest example of that, because I think he had actually contacted us and said, I would really like to help you out with your blog. You know, is there anything I can do? Can I do this or that or whatever? And we did actually need, and still do, of course, need his skills. We were like, yeah, actually, we could make use of some digital artwork here. Um, Can you do that? And every time I've asked him to do something or, you know, asked him to come up with some art for something, he comes up with it in really short order and always to a high standard. And that's why we've kept him about is because he's good at what he does and he'll do it quickly and reliably. And that's the kind of thing that we need. Um, that and it's always entertaining when you do the clarion voice around. <laughs> <laughs> that, felt. That's the secondary reason why we keep him around because uh, it's hilarious when, to hear him break and shut down when I, uh, when I do either of those voices. But uh, 
another example I can use of someone who's of that last one who's, you know, a car- uh, someone whose career that we followed and decided that, you know, we could actually make use of him for something would be the most recent person that we brought on uh, would be Lunabotic, um, the the person who does the uh, Lunabot Tumblr. Um, so happens to be friends with Mecca, and uh, I, I got in touch with him and said, you know, actually I think, you know, having seen what you can do, you know, would you like to share your brilliance with us? And particularly, you know, you and Beth have a chat and see what uh, techniques and knowledge you can share, because it would be great to have, you know, two people who can animate at our disposal. So we brought him on board as well. But yeah, it it varies from case to case uh, in terms of how we will bring people on and what we'll have them do. Um, But for the most part, for the people that we have currently, it's mostly been... um, recruitment on a on a you know as and when needed basis and uh that was how we brought beth on it was how me and hazel originally ended up on it and likewise you know mecca presented himself as with a you know with a useful skill at a time when we needed it so it's primarily that but uh, there are variations and exceptions. It's very much a case of, you know, if me or Hazel or anyone else catches sight of someone and says, you know, hey, this person here looks like they can do a really good job of X, Y, or Z. Maybe we should approach them and see if they can help us out. Then I usually will um, because, you know, uh, I trust the guys in my team to uh, to know a uh, good talent when they see it. And uh, most of them are pretty good judges of character, so... Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. I have one last question before I before I just decide. Well, before we end the interview or whatever. Normally, I pretty much just took over this. I feel a bit guilty. Okay, so just one more question before um, uh, we end the interview. What is uh, each one of your favorite thing that you have done or that has been done for the blog? Do you mean as in, th- uh, as in like things that we've done, as in like posts we've done, or just particular bits that we've contributed, or uh, contribution, posts, pictures, uh, projects, storylines, whatever? What are your your favorite things? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I think in my case, my favorite thing that I've contributed to the blog as a whole uh, would be some of the characters that we have. Um, just aspects of the characterization and stuff that we've written. Um, there have been some really memorable bits that have come up in, in the past. Um, and the actual, the whole idea of what was it? The way the characters have come about, the, uh, the extended cast, that is the, um, the guys that are with Britannia currently down in the, uh, in the case. Oh, okay. Yeah. The way those characters have come together and been fleshed out, you know, a lot of that's been been my work as, like, most of them were actually my characters to begin with. Granted, again, they were, like, collaborative work between myself and Hazel. I guess, all in all, I would say my favorite thing about doing stuff with Aspertania is just the whole idea of how, it's all, how it all pans out, how we develop things and seeing things come together. If, if if that's not too big, <laughs> no, that's that's perfect. What about you guys? What about you, Beth? Oh, my favorite thing I've done. That's tricky. I have to say quite a lot of the gifts I've made because those always end up being really funny. Oh. And what? The bloody eyes was what I did, and all the print, all the print <laughs> ones where she's spinning and all random bits like that. <laughs> and, and what about you, Hazel? Um, I can think of a, certainly a couple of posts and um, and pieces that we ended up making in the uh, the blog that I'm particularly proud of. Usually after a massive binge of coffee overnight, in some <laughs> cases, which isn't healthy and Sketchy doesn't recommend I do, but sometimes I, I I'm my worst own worst enemy. Um, the St. Patrick's Day thing in particular comes to mind. Oh yes, because it was come up with on a whim a week before needed. Uh, was my computer was did. breaking down, and over the course of the St. Paddy's Day night, we were actually putting pictures together and uploading them and everything. <laughs> so it was really one of those things where it was it was just a, a huge relief that the whole thing came to came to pass. I mean, that was ten really intricate pictures 
over the course of not very not much time at all being drawn. That's more like a bit of um, technical pride that I take in that particular one. In terms of what I'm most proud of overall, it's it's been the way that the story has evolved, not necessarily in the way that I intended it to, but in some cases, in it's it's the way it's the way that it's sort of other things have come out of it. For example, I mean, using Sketchy's example of using the the characters. For example, there were two characters whom we meet and who we're going to explore a little... We're going to see them a little bit more often in the upcoming weeks. Uh, one of them is... Uh, his name is Nutcracker. He's a sapper, which is, an, uh, which is a royal guard engineer, essentially. Someone who's tasked with blowing things up and carting things around. And he has a little scene with um, a one of the divers who's down there, who's a big burly mare by the name of Palescent Sheen, uh, or Sheeny. And she looks, she's got a mohawk and she looks like the kind of big roughy tufty sort of girl who doesn't take much nonsense from anyone and is just, in a way, one of the lads. And me and Sketchy conceptualised what would happen if these two characters interact. And essentially we put our shipping specs on and we decided to ship them. <laughs> and it was just interesting how these two inconsequential characters, I mean, Nutcracker we already had an idea of, but Pearl was created just to sort of be there um, and how they essentially become this uh, this potential pairing that uh, could come about that won't even be shown on screen but will be shown will may be shown in any sort of fic if we get round to finishing that okay. and it's that that I like I like exploring these little characters that really don't mean much on the whole but to us they are they're like children in a way, yeah. you know, only more agreeable because we can do what we want with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, they are your babies and you, you, you're you happy to see them uh, uh, appear and do stuff on the blog, of course. This, this is a quick interjection on that to give you some perspective of how bonkers we are in, a, in regards to doing things with characters that have such little consequence. That thing that uh, Hazel mentioned there, this idea of... Well, this, uh, this, this fic that has been written about those two, it's currently 16,164 words long. What? <laughs> Just for a pair of... In- uh, wow. Shipping a pair of inconsequential characters, and it's not... What? That's <laughs> long, yo. <laughs> so it's where, some of the, it's where some of the loveliest parts of this is, uh, of, the, of the, the cast have come from. Uh, Starbright and Flashbang, for example, the Bat Pony and the oh. uh, Unicorn Girl. <laughs> They're, our fa- they're one of my favourite and cutest pairs. Um, there was a little scene uh, where it slightly uh, cops a look at this uh, at this royal guard who was accompanying uh, Freeze Pop at the time, and someone actually asked us a question saying, "Oh, Fre- uh, slightly likes what he sees, slightly likes what she sees," um, and you know we did a little pick sort of teasing at that, and then it re- it's revealed that the uh, the cult in question already has a, uh, a significant other, a cult friend. And it's just, it's the little things. It's the background characters. It's the reason why in the show we've given such vivid personalities to Vinyl Scratch. I mean, even her name. And Octavia never had a name until the fandom came along. We, we love true, to true. give ideas and personalities and backstories to these little background ponies who have no bearing on the main show at all. And that's pretty much what quite a lot of uh, British world is. It's the guys in the background who are the most important, as is true in real life, really. You know, the can unsung I, heroes. You can know. I say that I absolutely adore the names of every one of the OCs you have on the blog? <laughs> like, they are absolutely brilliant. It's, like, awesome. They do sound perfect British names that are also related to uh, their talents, and they sound like pony names as well. It's unbelievable. It's like, how how hard did you guys have to uh, think and work to get to those names and go like, okay, we're going to go with these names? I'll leave this one to Sketchy, actually, because... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't be my forte, after all. Um, most of the cast of characters that we have... Uh, well, using the again using the squad with Patani as an example, um, they all came about as a result of an earlier bit of writing. The one I mentioned earlier, actually, which was the bit of writing that occurred 
between Buck 2012 and the beginning of Ask Britannia being a thing. Um, that particular writing project, um, I had to come up with... We, we basically needed a squad of ponies that needed to go with Britannia and Treespop on this mission they were going on. And uh, so Hazel was like, what do this squad look like? You know, can I get a bit of info about them? And I hadn't really thought about it much till then, because I'd just been like, well, you know, they're just going to be a squad of Royal Guards. So I was like, well... Uh, well, let me think about that then. So I decided to have a think about it, and I was like, right, well, from a practical perspective, it's going to have to be fairly balanced in terms of Earth bunnies, unicorns, and pegasi. So I was like, right, okay. So I thought, well, let's say, uh, let's say four pegasi, two Earth bunnies, two unicorns. That should round it out nicely. So I was like, right, what are they going to be called? Um, and my thinking when I named them was like, you know, what's the sort of names you would give to ponies who are, you know, what names sound like names that wouldn't be out of place in a military setting um, and yet are also representative of the kind of stuff that they can do. And I thought, right, okay. I was like, well, hmm, let's think. Flashbang's a good name for a, a Royal Guard. Actually, interesting thing about Flashbang, he was already named before that particular project started because he was made use of in a fic even before this one had started. He was actually made use of in Sketch Sound Serenata, one of my other, you know, one of my own solo writing projects. So he turned up in that the first time we ever saw him. And that was just when you would a name for a throwaway uh, character that would just be there and talk with Freeze Pop a bit. So that... Ground guard so, number six, basically. <laughs> so that was how he started out life. But uh, the rest of them, uh, Nutcracker, Avalanche, Long Shots, um... Scarlet Streak, Missile, Dive Bomb, etc. They all came about as a result of me thinking, right, you know, I need to give names to these ponies. So I thought, thought, right, okay, what's the kind of name you'd give to, say, you know, I thought, right, what sounds like, you know, what sounds like a big strong earth pony name? I was like, Avalanche would be a good one. And I was like, Nutcracker would be another good one. And I was like, those both sound like, you know, words that don't sound out of place as pony names. And they also convey a feeling of strength to them. And then I was like, right, okay, uh, Pegasi, what are we going to do here? So I thought, right, you know, what sounds like a name that both represents speed and the ability to, like, say, attack or go on the offensive. And it's like, Missile would definitely work as a military, you know, as, as a Royal Guard Pegasus name, as would Dive Bomb. And I thought, but you also, you're also going to need someone who can maybe scout or, you know, who's a bit acrobatic. And that was how Scarlet Streak was born. We've not seen him in the blog yet. We might do in future, but we've not seen him yet. Um, and then I also got to the well, they're going to need a medic um, because it's not wise to go on a mission now anyway without taking a medic. That was where Mercy got her name because that, again, sounds like the sort of name you would expect a, me- a medical pony to have. Essentially, if we get right down to it, it's taking what the show does, this whole nominative determinism that a pony who is best suited to a particular task tends to have the sort of name that reflects upon that task. I mean, Applejack, for example working with apples uh rarity her her particular uh senses for creating unique pieces of artwork and looking for gems and so many of the background ponies reflect that as well octavia the uh the highfalutin cellist <laughs> and vinyl scratch who of course scratches the vinyl when she does her djing and that it was that same kind of logic that led itself to giving quite a lot of our characters their names while so sort of making them feel as if they fit in with the wide and varied cast of MLP. But that said, there are certain characters who do break that mold. Britannia's a good example. Because she is a noble pony, she is of the ruling she is part of the ruling class, if you will, the same sort of class that composes Fancy Pants and Prince Blue Blood and uh, Hoity Toity and all that kind of aspect. We gave, I gave her a, a really long double-barreled name to reflect the sort of names that are typical to that kind of class in, in the UK. So she has the name Buckingham McScone, so it's double barreled so you've got the McScone element comes from the whole trottish Scotland style background, and the Buckinghams are the more cantalot, well-bred, Englishy sort of side. Um, her first name is Britannia, uh, because that's what it was given as by the con. Um, but itself, we've given, we've given a lot of thought into that name and where that could come from, and it's actually, spoilers, it actually is the name of a princess. 
She was named after a princess. Ooh. Well, technically she was named after a boat, but the boat was named after a princess, so that sort of works. <laughs> and her middle name is uh, Guinevere, which is a horsey kind of play on Guinevere, the wife of King Arthur. <laughs> So a lot of her name is basically taking all these aspects of posh Britishness and putting them on one pony. And even having such a long name is kind of part and parcel for being this overladen, big, you know, big shot, which is what she's supposed to be. But amongst her friends, she just prefers to be called a plain Brit. So, But I mean, <laughs> the thing, you know, if you think about it... Uh... Tanya is not the only one with a bit of a exotic and out of place sounding name for this. Yes. <laughs> oh dear, no. <laughs> I mean, Svelte's name. name as well is uh, rather. Yeah. <laughs> the name Svelte Yanko Filimila von Nocturne doesn't exactly scream my little pony now, does it? But then again, we've had a lot of ponies who turned up on, on the show who do. We've got uh, Miss Harshwinnie, for example. What about That's... Princess Miyamore Kalensa? Yeah, Mia More Cadenza. Uh, I think that doesn't scream pony either, yet there she is. Yeah. Yes, at the end of the day, what does Mia More Cadenza mean? It sounds like my love, you my, know, my, my, what, yeah. my lovely cadence. It mm. literally translates to my love or my lovely cadence. That's yes. what it translates to. Essentially, what you'll find in MLP is there'll be a mixture of different names. I mean, uh, and even different naming conventions. I mean, Pinkamina Diane Pie. You know, <laughs> Diane is not exactly what you would consider to be a pony name either, and yet she's got one. So um, I think it's one of those cases of when you're choosing a name for a character in MLP, you need to consider what that character does or what that character um, is like and, you know, try and find a name that reflects that. And it can either be a play on an already existing name or it can just be a description, pretty much like how racehorses are named, you know, red rum and things like that. Um, that's uh, that's another aspect as well to take into account, the fact that they are horses. So as many <laughs> horse puns as possible, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I do happen to wonder sometimes whether some of the names that appear in the show happen to be just, you know, simplifications of already complicated names. I mean, did uh, did someone really think it through when they called their son Fancy Pants, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, he seems to have made it work for himself. <laughs> yeah, I certainly have. <laughs> Rarity, jolly good to see you. <laughs> That's the good thing about this show, is that it's amazing how they can make some usual words just work. But this is really just a case of caring about the characters you create, especially OCs. I'm going to have to drop off now. Dinner is calling Aww. me at this time. Aww. so It was fun being on the show if you finish recording before you get back. Well, we'll see you later, Beth. And thank you for being on the show, Beth. And sorry for being so long that dinner's already ready. <laughs> no worries about it. See you guys soon. Good Bye, to Beth. see you, Beth. See you later. Take Bye. care. Later. The, the way you run your blog is based on uh, British mm. or how the United Kingdom sees itself and its people, right? Yes, pretty much. So, what if a Commonwealth pony comes to your Tumblr blog? What would that look like? Hint, hint, me, me. Well, we've got a couple of examples of those who... Well, one example from one part of the Commonwealth is uh, our Australian mayor, mm-hmm. who's from Terra Hostralis, and she is essentially Steve Irwin the Pony as a mayor. Yeah. Mm. Slightly bonkers. <laughs> we've expanded essentially beyond the realms of, of the pony lands. We've visited the, zebra, uh, the zebras and places like that. There's also the Philippines... <laughs> oh my like god <laughs> oh. Oh. so I think it's one of those cases of any sort of pony that is essentially an XP from our world who is clearly either Australian or Canadian or uh, Malaysian or what What would that be, Malaysia? <laughs> possibly, yes, Malaysia um, what they'll be is they're still ponies at the end of the day they, you know, they like sweet mm-hmm. stuff they've got their cutie marks which tell them what their talents are and all these sort of aspects but they might carry with them certain things that <coughs> might be a little bit like that particular country or a little bit like that particular nation 
And all we would have to do as writers is just research into that particular country, look into what kind of pop culture is important to them and how they present the world and what their own culture is and sort of meld the two things together somewhat. And thanks a lot, guys, for answering all of our questions. And wow, look at the time. We have been asking you a lot. That's what happens when I crash into the podcast halfway through. I make it go for longer. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's no problem, man. It's no problem. You made it interesting. So anyway, where can they find you guys, like uh, individually or as a group? Well, obviously as a group, the main place to look would be the Ask Britannia Tumblr, which can be found at askbritannia.tumblr.com. Uh, reference will, of course, be in the show notes. Um, as for individually... Uh, I can be found almost everywhere in this community. Uh, I am on Film Fiction, I am on DeviantArts, I am on SoundCloud, I am on Twitter. And all across the board, on all of those, you will find me as Sketchy Sounds. Sometimes there will be an underscore if it's somewhere that doesn't allow space and names, but usually, it, <coughs> but if it does allow space and names, that will be <coughs> Sketchy, that space, Sounds. <coughs> Pardon. Me. Are the are, are the cuffs included in your name as well? <laughs> no, no. That's, that's just an extra bonus I give you free of charge. You should work. Oh please! I feel so special. Oh, I um, <laughs> myself, I am more than likely able to be found on uh, yes, sasquatania.tumblr. dot uh, dot com. Um, alternatively, my mod blog is hazelhooves. Uh, dot tumblr. dot com. Um, I don't really... Well, I use either or, but the best place to find me will be on the Tumblr. And um, uh, alternatively, I can I'm just knock it around on, st- on Sketchy Stream on occasion. We should also mention Beth as well. Uh, of course. Beth has yeah. her own Tumblr. It's, uh, as I believe, it's just bethybird.tumblr.com. She also is on DeviantArt and various other places. It's worth noting she is the main person responsible for running the Ask Britannia MLP uh, art group on DeviantArt. So if you go on there, if you it would be I think it's Ask Britannia MLP dot deviantart dot com. Uh, it's Beth that's usually the one that's uh, that maintains that and uh, runs that. So if uh, if you want to catch her you can find her there. You can also find her on DeviantArt. You can find her on uh, Tumblr and you can also find her on Twitter as well. And she does stream occasionally too. Ah, okay. I'll be sure to put that into the show notes. And once again, thank you guys for coming on and sharing your story with us because it has been really interesting. Pleasure to tell. Yes, it has. It's been a wonderful chance to uh, to saw everyone else's ears off with my head cannoning and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. So anyway, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at gmail.com. And if you'd like to contact us personally, you can reach us. Well, details are in the show notes. You can also reach us on Twitter. Um, the show's Twitter account is at mbsshow. Sweetie, so, but we'll, we'll technically complain about editing the episode and complain how long it takes us to record. Because that's to be all I'm good for these days. Oh, no, no, you're a good... You're good for a lot of things, but we've been, um, how do I say, abusing you. So sorry. No one understands my suffering. <laughs> I'm sorry. And also you can reach me at Norman Sanzo. I usually tweet pictures of food, toys, and whatever tickles my fancy. And what about you, James? You can find me in your bed at night, warming up the bed sheets. <laughs> 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 oh my. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at James underscore Cork. Uh, you can find me on, tum- on Tumblr on askmovieslate.tumblr.com and you can find me on DeviantArt uh, on uh, jamescork.deviantart.com. Awesome. And also please subscribe and rate us on iTunes as Teacher Radio and also like our Facebook page. Links will be provided in the show notes. Well, I have been Norman Sanzo. I have been James Cork. As far as I'm aware, I'm still Sketchy Sounds. And he's been Sketchy Sounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see you guys next week with maybe a lot more or a lot less British. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you for listening. Cheerio.
Okay, Norman, wait one second because, uh, well, I'm just going to paste in the conversation here. Yeah, James has just come back and. Oh dear. Oh dear. Gosh. I should bring him in and be like, where have you been, you slacker? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. sure. You know what? Bring him in and I'll, I'll, I'll bring, I'll put on Sweetie Bot and just have a go. Oh, uh, and he said I was slacking. <laughs> James has made it to the call. Clara, how do one does this? Because I am not seeing his picture up yet. <clears throat> I see his picture. You see his picture? I don't. It's not picked it up yet, though. Uh, he's supposed to be ready. Wow, this is going to be one awesome editing. I mean, Sweetie's going to edit this real good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> Honest, you always make me do all the work. Yes, oh, wait, wait, what do we... Oh, James? Hola. Thou hast summoned the god of movies and ponies! <laughs> uh, so here you are at last. Honestly, and earlier he accused me of slacking. Hey, hey I was busy. I was watching the Monuments Men. <laughs> that is worth making everybody wait. <laughs> Sure, sure, you wanted to make us wait so you could watch the film. Honestly, they don't pay me enough for this. Heck, they don't pay me at all. <laughs> uh, Who the boy. hell let the toaster get in the studio? Toaster? <laughs> I have so much anger inside that you don't even know what I'm capable of. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why don't you shut up and go make me some French waffles? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry, sweetie. I'll throw in some extra bites for you later on. <laughs> so, James, how are you, man? I'm great. To quote Philip J. Fry from Futurama, I'm walking on sunshine. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Wow, this is going to be awesome. Anyway, oh, uh, my God. Man. So, how is it going, everybody? How are you guys? Uh, everything's okay. And, well, let me just... Everything is awesome. Yay! <laughs> Everything is good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, let me just pull you in. And three, two.